Hello and welcome to the Promise Land, a show about Manchester United and part of the 90 Min Podcast Network. I'm Scott Saunders, joined by Rob Blanchett, as ever, after Manchester United lose at Spurs. Manchester United make a decision, an official decision, on Mason Greenwood. And as we enter the final two weeks of the transfer window, uh, the club are not in the best of positions at the moment, Rob, are they? Uh, We'll talk about all of those matters on today's show. But Rob, how are you doing? Mm, Lots of face pulling, Scott, like you just saw there as you opened the show and talked about the topics on the agenda at Manchester United today. Uh, Yeah, I'm fine, but kind of relieved, I think, now that Manchester United reached the decision that they did on Mason Greenwood. And of course, we'll talk about some of that today. Yes, uh, subscribe to the podcast wherever you get your podcasts and watch us on YouTube, The Promise and uh, Manchester United Podcast. Like the video, subscribe, leave a comment for us and also pop the notification bell on so you never miss a show for us as well. Follow us on social media at double underscore Scott Saunders on X, I, G and TikTok. Rob at underscore Rob underscore B on X and YouTube and at Promise Land MU on X as well. I'm calling it X. I changed my little uh, running order, Rob, there. I refuse. Prompts. I'm still going to call it Twitter. Twitter. That's what I'm doing. Uh, I'm just, Twitter X, whatever you want to call it. I can't it. unplug my brain. I, I, I've been calling it like Twitter X for a little while just because I will slowly but surely. I'm be... sure a lot, lots of people will. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's, uh, we did a, a show the other day about Mason Greenwood. Obviously, we, we see that the com- some of the comments weren't too kind. Uh, I, I, I appreciate it's a devi- divisive issue um, and that people can have their opinion. Rob and I agree on the position that, well, we don't agree on the position that Man United have taken throughout this process. Let's just say that, but we do, uh, we we did think there was a, r- a right way to operate and go about this. And in the end, Rob, Man United have, according to like, you know, our stance on this and obviously several hundreds of thousands of people's, uh, probably millions of people's opinion on this, United have come to the right decision. So let's start there. Mm. Yes. Yeah, this is this has to be a business decision first and foremost, a contractual one about whether someone was in breach of their contracts or not. Now, there's a bigger debate here, obviously, about domestic violence and whatnot. And you know, there's more going to be talked about around this this subject with Mason Greenwood in the weeks and months ahead. The reason why Manchester United have come to this decision is that he's brought the club into disrepute. It's as simple as that. And Mason Greenwood, in his statements, has admitted that completely, takes his side of the responsibility, as he calls it, uh, for why those social media posts went out. And United have made it clear what they believe. Mason Greenwood has said what he believes. That's okay. They're, everyone's entitled to opinion. Our audience is Scott. We are. But ultimately, you can't play for Manchester United anymore. It's just as simple as that. And that's where we've got to. So, um, a good decision by the by the board, by the chief executive, but something I think that could have been done in six weeks rather than six months. It's not even... Well, I agree with the timing. Uh, obviously, I just think the way that United have operated themselves throughout the process reflects really poorly on the club as a whole. Mm. Uh, I think it's... I'll even I'll even go to the to the extent here. I know that the Glazer family are criticised for pretty much everything to do with their ownership of Manchester United, uh, and it's been referred to in certain places that Joel Glazer or Avram Glazer have been involved. I think it's Joel Glazer who have been involved in the decision making process here, but it has been pinned on Richard Arnold, who's had to mm. make the decision. Weak leadership from the top is what I'll say. Uh, they've not been decisive on this. They've not acted in the right. In they've not acted ethically. I think they have tried their very, very best to bring this talented footballer back, and been swayed by public opinion, public uproar, um, and you turned when if they were decisive in the first place, and this is a reflection on the club as a whole over the past 18 years under under the ownership of the Glazers, they have... It's been, it's been poorly operated. Uh, it's been weak management. They have tried to take the best financial decision in, in the club's interest. 
and been burned for it when they could have taken the right the right ethical decision in the first place and avoided this entire not avoided it because obviously they they had to deal with it um and it was a it's been a difficult case to to get around but the fact that united have tried to made this whole plan to bring to bring Mason Greenwood back and ticking off making people upset that United actually wanted to you know make this decision to bring him back in and then they've just u-turned it, it's just it doesn't sit right with me Rob at all no look every business Scott whether you're a small business or a super large business like Manchester United you are judged on your operational strategy yeah so your operations have to be robust and you have to have plans in place and contingencies to be able to sort through things. Now, sometimes a case like this happens where it's off the cuff. It's an individual case and you have to judge it on its own merit and work around it. But you're totally right. You, you can't be au fait in a matter like this. Like they suspended him for the right reason, Scott. And then they just let it go on and on and on and on for months and months and months and months until obviously what happened yesterday. And that's really where you get it. And I think when you dig into the detail of Richard Arnold's statement and what he said, his open letter to Manchester United fans, it's just too willy. It's too willy. Like, you, you're the boss of the company, <laughs> yeah? And you have to uphold the operational standards of that company. Manchester United have not done that. But I do think that that is something that football in itself is guilty of from top to bottom. We we're always saying, Scott, why has that football club done that? Why has that a, a chairman done that? Why is it that that governing body has done that? It happens all the time in football. And I think that's really what this is about as a wider question is that football is not fit for its own governance. Like it makes you do think that maybe football now does need independent regulators and stuff like that because these massive businesses haven't really got the HR experience to understand how these things work. Whereas, you know, other blue chip companies with the same value on the stock exchange do have that because it's important in the business place. So, yeah, not not a good look on Manchester United, but I'm sure now what we will see, Scott, in the next seven to ten days at the end of the transfer window is that Manchester United will take this bad spin of the past few days and try to spin it positively into both player sales and player acquisitions. Lord, do they need to do that? Uh, we'll talk about the Tottenham game shortly. Uh, we'll talk about Rafa Varane who's been linked with a move to Saudi Arabia in the last yeah. couple of days. I don't think that was going to happen at any time in the immediate future. Not yet. Not yet, but no. down the line, potentially. Uh, but United put out their own statement yesterday. Richard Arnold made his own statement. Mason Greenwood made his own statement. And I'm guessing since you're eight minutes into this podcast, you already do know that <laughs> we haven't actually said, but Mason Greenwood will be... Uh, is is it fair to say I, I forget what, I haven't got the statement in front of me? Offloaded, or will leave Manchester United. Let's just say that, but it's not contract termination by the looks of it. It is definitely not. U United will have to look to find him a new club, which isn't Manchester United, whether that's on loan or via permanent transfer or via loan and permanent transfer later on down the line. Uh, how do you see it playing out, Rob? Could potentially be a free transfer if Manchester United really want to wash their hands of this now. And seeing how toxic it's been in the last week, they might go for the free transfer route because they might also want to say, well, we didn't take any money for this guy who's done these things. You know, Because this is the thing, Scott. In, in theory, in the real world, he gets sacked. Well, in the real world. Well, like, you say like, done these things. Not, that's United, happened in football. United's statement was that they don't think that he's done this. So okay. He's not know. guilty of the criminal offence. And we know that, and that's why the CPS did not take it further because they did not believe their evidence would stand up. Now, that does not mean that he didn't do it. That's not what the what we're talking about. Again, as a well, business... Well, the United have said... United have said that they've heard all the evidence that they've heard and they don't believe that Mason Grimby did it. So they've made their stance clear. And he's made his stance clear by saying, I didn't do it. That's fine. That's, that's the legal standpoint. That's okay. You're allowed to have that opinion. But... And this is where the buck comes. You don't need to have the bar as high as criminality when you're talking about a business decision. This is an employment case. So in terms of the employment side of it, Mason Greenwood needs to leave the football club. He brought the club into disrepute. So this, that's as kind of as simple as it gets. And I think now United understand that the emotive nature of, of the whole story of the last 18 months. 
and now they're trying to obviously bull- make themselves bulletproof to a lot of the fallout of that. And they have not helped themselves, have they? What Manchester United tend to do in these crises is to try and flip it into some kind of positive. And that will be the Mason Greenwood, I think, obviously, he's going to leave the football club and they've confirmed that he will never wear the shirt again. I think that was what's really important because he's not fit to wear the shirt. Simple as that. And they know it. And Mason Greenwood knows it. And that's why Mason Greenwood has gone, I'm off to play my career elsewhere because he doesn't walk out, walk out Old Trafford Scott and get all that. He really doesn't. So I think... United, United now will try and find a way to move them on. And I said, it could be a free transfer or it will be the classic undisclosed fee of wherever he goes. And Manchester United will take that fee and obviously reinvest it into their squad. And Mason Greenwood will carry on his career elsewhere. It could be Saudi Arabia, could be Europe. I don't know, but potentially America one day. Maybe he'll come back to the Premier League. I can't see him going to a Premier League club as it stands because the feeling that is there at Old Trafford will be there every one of the other 19 Premier League grounds when he goes there. Interest from uh, Italy and yeah. Turkey, uh, some from Saudi Arabia, as we understand it. United have <coughs> a number of weeks to, uh, of course, if it is to Saudi Arabia, I think the transfer window is open for Longer, an yeah. extra couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but United have a decision to make there. They have made their position clear. After weeks and months of dragging their heels, really, like I say, they have not they've not dealt with this in the best way they possibly could. I think it reflects on the poor operations of the club, and you see yeah. that in all elements of the of the business, really. Whether that's it, it, yeah, you know, with everything, I, I, least, I'm talking about yeah, transfers so. there, really, and plus everything else. But you know. Yeah, the and even the ownership stronger. process, the ownership process as well. Yeah, look, do you know what, Scott? I've seen a lot of that actually recently, especially the last day or two, with people linking this to the ownership, right? And I'm not going to do that, right? I'm not going to do that because the Glazers are weak, yeah, and they should not run our football club, not should not own our football club. That's actually the problem with the Premier League allowing these rogue owners coming and buying our football clubs. It's the truth, yeah. That's the way that goes. That's a bigger subject. Now, the Glazers, as you said, and I said this in the last show hands up like that, they're going to put it on Richard Arnold because he's the chief operating officer. That's what happens in business. That's generally the, that guy is the one who makes the choice and moves it on. But of course, everyone has had their say. But I think when you look at it like this, it, the bigger conversation here is that football does not have robust operations at the very top to deal with these cases. And do you know what, Scott? It's not the first time this has happened at a football club. It's just it's the first time it's happened at Man United in recent memory we might be talking about another player in the next weeks and months to come in a similar vein. Man United now have a framework of what to do, don't they? Because they've been through a hell of a lot in the last six months. But that's another conversation for another day. Let's see where that goes. But this is the whole thing with United, is that they constantly make these hiccups, Scott. Constantly make these huge errors and then have to just backtrack massively and when you live your life on the front page of a newspaper like Man United do, and one of the things Richard Arnold said about Mason Greenwood is about starting his life again away from like the scrutiny of Manchester United. It's the scrutiny of football. Football is the most popular sport in the world. It is a religion. That's what it is. So this is, you know, football can't be bigger than the subjects that matter. That's what I'm trying to say, is that you need robust operations from the top to kind of know what you are, what you stand for, you know, like as a company and as a football team, as a football club. And I'm not quite sure Man United do. That's partly the Glazers' fault, of course, and we don't like the Glazers. But I think the guys running the football club, the day-to-day football, football operations side of it, also need to have a clear vision of what they expect from themselves, and I think that that's not been present in the last few weeks around this Mason Greenwood case. Well, yeah, uh, we'll talk about Mason Greenwood uh, when I'm guessing it is a when mm. uh, when news becomes clear about where he will depart to, uh, the nature of that transfer or whatever it ends up being, if transfer is the right word. Uh, we'll discuss that at a later date. Uh, but United have made the decision. Mason Greenwood will leave Manchester United and there's a few weeks to uh, to sort that one out. Anyway, let's move to... We'll stay... We'll, we'll, we'll talk transfer market. We'll come to the Spurs defeat uh, in a little bit, but we wanted to address or just talk about some speculation involving Rafa Varane. 
mm-hmm. who has been linked with the move to Saudi Arabia. We've talked about this summer, Rob, and when we were doing our what should United do in the transfer market, I think earlier in the summer, I said, sign Rafa Varane's successor if you can. Of course, it's not this. It's not the absolute uh, top priority, but he has been linked with the move to Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's been pretty much ruled out that it will happen in the next couple of weeks, but that's not to say this won't happen eventually. I think it will happen eventually because you know that's the golden path, isn't it, for retirement? There's my retirement fund. It's in Saudi Arabia, and we're also seeing now probably top players in the next year or two going that way as well as they try to build that league for their own purposes. Uh, I think. With Rafa Varane, it kind of just goes back to what we just said there about having operational value, about contingency planning. And you know, we're talking about the football side of this. Eh? We're not talking about the HR side. Is that United need to look at the wider picture. And I do think that when you look at the age groups of Casemiro and Varane, yeah, they're not, they're not ancient. They're not finished. They're not old. But you don't have to look too far in the future, Scott, do you? To think you might need to cover those positions today and not in a year. Because when they go in a year or whenever, that's really, really difficult for you to then sort out then, isn't it? It's really like, you know, player goes and then you have a big golf and a chasm. Again, Manchester United not having contingency planning in the, in the transfer market, something we've talked about for so many years. Do you know what we said, Scott, as well, not so long ago? We said, like, if, um, if United were getting to the end of the transfer window, we said that it wasn't many positions to actually need filling immediately and yet here we are two games in and you're already kind of thinking probably need to do some more business <laughs> you know and that's what happens in football isn't it things change so so quickly so yeah I think Rafa Varane will stay with us for another season and I think Casemiro as well but I can see those two players going to Saudi Arabia in 12 months and Man United need to sort that out now in terms of their contingency planning and not in six months time. Varane did play in uh, the, sp- I thought he was one of the better players on the pitch, actually. Well, for yeah. United, anyway. Yeah, uh, he looks fit at the moment, and and he looks okay. And and like this is the thing: the problem with Rafa Varane is that we do know that he's made a paper, just as simple as that. Pulls up with injuries, you know, now and then, and that's something I think Ten Hag will fear. And this is why Ten Hag has been shopping in the in the market for another centre back because he needs someone on that coverage. Yeah, he's got Victor Lindelof, but. You know, he doesn't want Harry Maguire, he still doesn't want, and I'm still predicting that Harry Maguire might leave on transfer deadline day. But United need to probably bring in a younger version, someone in there, Tadebo, someone of that ilk, that you can now break in over the next 12 months and uh, and maybe Varane's successor when Varane decides to leave. Well, for me, I think United have, uh, especially if Varane's going to stay for another year, I, I wouldn't put centre back unless Maguire leaves on the position, on the priority no. positions list. In the next couple of weeks, um, we'll talk about the midfield and possibly the attack in a little bit. Um, for me, I think you've got to start identifying a long-term... I'm talking better. I, I don't want to say better than Tadebo, but I'm going to say better than Tadebo. I'm, I'm talking like <laughs> your your player who can do it for 10 years, who is... Your Vardy the best. Yeah, that kind of profile. Yeah. I mean... Uh, if th- those profile of players are few and far between. I know you talk about Mark Gahey. Uh, I've been talking about Antonio Silva from Benfica for a, for a little while. Mm-hmm. Um, that kind of, you know, I'm not sure how, how old Gahey is actually, um, but Antonio Silva is like 20, 21 years old. Mm-hmm. Ideally, if you have him learning off Iran for a year, then great. But if you give him another year of developing in in top flight football, in, in European football, the Ruben Diaz move, you know, because uh, Man City yeah. have been doing that for a few years and it's actually working out quite well for them. United need to start planning like they do. They do. But again, I think this goes back maybe again, when you look at the two football clubs about contingencies and how you build. This is this is what you do is that you don't think about the transfer when you need it. And that's what United have done for so long. What happened, Scott? Ronaldo ended up going out the door. You didn't have a strike and you just didn't sort it out. <laughs> you just didn't. You just waited and waited and waited and sat on your hands and sat on your hands. You had the chance to get they Harry Kane. They signed Mount Exactly. 
because that's not called contingency planning. That's called putting out fires. That's the opposite. So this is the whole thing. Is that like, yeah, Vec Horse, I thought as a, as a as a loan signing was was perfectly fine for what they needed at that moment. But it didn't smack towards a team that were looking to win things in the future. And that's where you are. Look at it this way, Scott. You just talked about Gahey there, but I'm going to compare that to like both Akanji and Ake at um, at Man City. Both completely unfashionable players in terms of the market and maybe with the fan base. But knowing that you're looking at certain coverage, because eventually you're thinking in a year's time, might be getting rid of Laporte. Good player, Laporte, but we might be getting rid of him. And that's the way you do it. Casemiro, if you're looking at Casemiro's performances just in the first two games, you've got to be thinking as Manchester United, we need that number six probably sooner rather than later. Not when it goes completely wrong and you end up sixth in the table. So this is the thing you said about Varane. Varane gets injured. You need to go get your centre-back. I like Tadebo. I think he's a development project. You could bring him in. But there are players out there. But as you said, they're few and far between of the Guardiol standard where you can just go out and buy ready-made or someone like, you know, like a, a Haaland. What do you do? You go and get a Hoyland, don't you? So it's the next level down. United are still operating in those markets, Scott, because they're not champions as it stands. They're a big club, but they need to think like champions, don't they? They need to have that kind of expertise at operational level. And that's the test, I think, for Ten Hag now, is to is to somehow in the next 10 days with the football club, the operational side, and with John Murto, to find their targets to actually get over the line because they definitely need more, Scott. I think that's really what the first two games and also pre-season has shown is that it's OK, but OK is not going to get you very far in the Premier League this season. So what do they need then? Because uh, I was I was at the Spurs game on Saturday. Yeah. For the second consecutive match, Eric Ten Hag blamed the profligacy and attack as was talking about that as the main issue. The fact that United created, I think they've created six clear cut chances uh, so far this season, and they're quite high up in the in the lead table for that, and they've scored one goal. Yeah. Uh, Ten Hag is pointing to the fact that United are not taking their chances as the main issue and is going, is sticking by his plan in midfield. Whereas everybody else is looking at, I, I agree with the attacking point. Like Anthony should have scored, should not have hit the post. Bruno Fernandes should have hit the, should have scored as well. I think United should have had a penalty. I mean, I don't understand the rules. But what's the, how many, what what is the main problem for you, Rob? Is it the midfield or is it the attack? Of course, it's the midfield. One hundred percent the midfield. And Eric Ten Hag knows it's the midfield, and he's playing the manager spin the roulette kind of game here. Of well, I'll blame something else. Yeah, of course. If you've got have had six big chances, statistically speaking, then you should be scoring more, shouldn't you, than just one? Um, but that's kind of hit or miss. Like you can sometimes, like you could have gone to that Tottenham game, couldn't you, Scott? And you not you might have scored three or four goals in the first half. You just might have done. And in the second half, you capitulate. But why do you capitulate? And it's the mesh in between the midfield and the attack. So I don't want to just say it's the attack. You've got Hoyland, obviously, to come into the team. And that might help a few things. I'm going to keep banging the drum that Marcus Rashford is not a number nine. And when he plays a number nine, he looks pathetic. Yeah, he cannot do the 10 things that a striker do. Yeah, he's quick. Yeah, he can finish. That's not what the game's about anymore. And Eric Ten Hag knows this. Eric Ten Hag knows this. But he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. So here well, we what, go. Why Scott. did he play Jaden Sancho through the middle in preseason? Have no idea. Absolutely no idea. And the weird thing was, Scott, that in preseason, that was one of the highlights that actually kind of worked. You know, the false nine was okay. Like in the games that we saw, we went, we were out there in Las Vegas watching preseason, that the false nine Kind of works. And I was like, well, I kind of like to see Bruno Fernandes in the false line because I think that he's that kind of player that if he gets the ball in and around the box, he'll create his X, as I said, his XAXG, all those things kind of merit that he could do that job. But you're giving Jaden a role because Jaden hasn't got a role elsewhere. Now, I get that that might have been what he was trying to do, just get minutes into Jaden Sancho's legs. But what we've seen in these game, two games, Scott, Jaden Sancho on the bench, and when he comes on, he plays on the left. And it's like, why are you not just putting Marcus on the left? It's what Marcus does. He's the best. Well, I said it last season. I think you disagreed with me. I think mean, he's one of the best left-sided players in the world when it comes to the attack. Disagree. Yeah, well, well, the metrics for me t- give me enough. I look at that and I say he can give Man United what they need from that left-hand side. He can score goals from there. 
I think what you need to look at is this, uh, Scott. We talk about Garnacho a lot, and you saw, especially against Tottenham, is how bad he looks off the ball because he's a young kid. And that's the problem, is that on the ball, yeah, he can dribble, he looks amazing, he can score goals, and he set you up with assists. But off the ball, that Tottenham goal came about because he is miles away from his man. Luke Shaw's going... I think I better cover the inside here because there's like a golf on the outside and then total, 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 total into the box and it's a goal and it's bad planning. So that again is the manager has to look at the tactics and say, right, how do I work that out? Do you know what? If you played Marcus Rashford there, that doesn't happen. It doesn't. Marcus will be in position and the player won't take him on. There won't be the space. And then there's always the threat of the counter press because Marcus gets the ball. He's gone. That's that. So I, I, I see why he's putting Marcus in the middle, but I disagree with it fundamentally. And I think what we're seeing is why we disagree with it is because Marcus Rashford is not a number nine. You're going to have to get Martial in there maybe as an emergency. Why are you not playing Sancho as a full sonata? I don't get it. I don't understand, Scott. What do you think? <laughs> I asked you the same question. I, I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, why why try something out in pre-season? And Unless he's works. convinced it didn't... It, well, maybe he thinks it didn't work. Maybe he didn't. Because exactly. he maybe he thinks it didn't work. Uh, or maybe have... something has happened since. Like maybe in training in the last week or two, he's tested it and gone, actually, yeah, it worked in pre-season. I liked it in pre-season, but I don't like it now. Now other players are getting fitter and they're doing different things. Um, but for me also, Scott, it's the senior players. I think, you know, for me, I, I kind of wrote down some bits and pieces the other day. And it was five senior players that I was really worried about. And and I'm still worried about them. Like as I look at them and I kind of think to myself, no, if you don't play well... It's got nothing to do with Mason Mount. It's got nothing to do with your new signing. It's about the players that have been at the football club for months and years. So let's talk about. I'll, I'll come to. The, I, I was going to ask you a question: How many players were United signed before the window? But I'll ask you that after this conversation. Um, let's talk about the midfield. Yes, uh, because I think we we don't disagree here. Um, I appreciate that Casemiro is a problem in there. Mm -hmm. But I personally think that Eric Ten Hag is hanging him out to dry. Because Mason Mount ain't getting involved in matches. He ain't. 14 passes he completed the other day out of 17. That is, he's he's doing the, you know, the high press. It worked at times for about half an hour in that game. It, it did work. I think he made... He was important in the turnovers, but United keep getting turned over, and Mason Mount is a is one of those players that gets turned over. I know Casemiro's been dribble pa Casemiro's been dribble past a few times so far this season, and looks slow. But Eric Ten Hag should know that Casem <laughs> even a fully fit Casemiro ain't stopping half of the things that have gone past him. I'm telling you, he ain't. He's never been that player. I don't understand it. Well, look how Wolves drew drove through Manchester United and then went home and played Brighton and got spanked by a proper team. So there you go. So you have to kind of compare those two things. Um, hanging him out to dry, I think, is a little bit harsh on the second game of the season. But what I will say is this, is that the game tactically is divided into two real separate phases. Off ball, on ball. You look at the metrics. Mason Mount is doing all the off ball stuff. He's doing what he's being asked to do. But you're right. On the ball, he's doing nothing. But I think you could literally say that when you look at ball progression, look at the stats from last year, previous years, to, to what's happened in just, say, two games or over pre-season, that none of the on-ball talent is doing any of their work. Luke Shaw is our best on-ball progressor and is doing nothing, right? So you, you, you've got to kind of, this is where I look at the kind of baseline. Casemiro, as you said, in a one-on-one -on -one race, there's two racehorses running up the pitch like that, is never going to win those races. So you have to find a way of stopping the ball further up the pitch so Casemiro isn't getting exposed. Now, I don't think that's Eric Ten Hag thinking, I'm going to hang my number six out to dry. I think he's thinking my team can defend higher up the pitch and Casemiro is the pivot and he looks after the scraps and the pieces and gets you going again when the ball breaks up there. But what we're seeing, this is why we're talking about the midfield, is this chasm between, say, Varane and Martinez and then... Further up the pitch, when you're looking at the average positions of what Man United are doing, they're almost playing with like seven <laughs> up the pitch. You know, I always call it the kind of the four, five, one in terms of the initial shape. It's actually more like pronounced. It's kind of like almost like seven up the pitch now. And United are playing this style of high press, 
not particularly Gagan pressing, which is where you kind of sit a little bit deeper and set traps. So I'd like to unite to go back to set traps, because I think if you do that, someone like Mason Mount can help you a lot. Mason Mount's putting the energy work in, Scott, but on the ball, it's difficult for him because United is still based around this whole myth about Bruno Fernandes has to create everything for you. Yeah, it should be spread through the team. And I don't think Bruno's been very good. I'm going to say it again. Like, people say you don't like Bruno. I think Bruno in his first two games has been horrible. Well, nobody's no, been good. Nobody's but been no good. one wants to mention those things. Like, just said Luke Shaw. People want to go, oh, you know, I love Luke Shaw. And I think he's a brilliant, one of the best left backs in the world. He's been dire. Dire in the first two games. Let's call it. So there are players like that. Marcus Rashford. Love Marcus to bits. Dire. Awful performances. So then we kind of just pick out the new boy and he doesn't know anyone or anything. He's just coming into the team. But you're right. This is maybe the thing about where you're bringing a player for 60 odd million, Scott, and what the expectations are from day one. I think Mason Mount, if he plays higher up the pitch and ends up being a 10 or a wider player, I think we get more productivity out of him. If you're playing as number eight, you're going to get mistakes in the same way that even if you chuck Kobe Manu in there tomorrow, who is an eight or can play the eight, you're going to get mistakes. So you have to think laterally like that. And I, I sometimes think Man United, we don't see this. Is that, you know, like we just talked there about Varane's injuries or Casemiro's slowness. Do you know what you have to do, Scott? Go into the transfer window and fix those things. Give yourself options. But United is always slim pickings, isn't it? Is that we're always talking about one problem being solved and, oh, look, there's another two problems that have just popped up. So I think that's going to be Eric Ten Hag's real real kind of uh, challenge this year is to make sure these kind of little things don't rear their head because they're right. They feel like old problems, Scott, like in terms of about keeping the ball and moving it on and not getting beaten on the energy side of the game. And yet you see Casemiro chugging after a 21 year old who's just sprinted past him and going into Man United's box. It's not fair on him, but that's his job. He's got to find a way to work with his midfield and those three midfielders have to work together to find an answer. It can't just be on one of them. All I'm asking is Eric Ten Hag to know his personnel. You should know. I'm sure he does. Like, I think he, I said hanging Casemiro out to dry. I'll stick by it. Yeah. I don't think Casemiro can do that job. I don't either. I and totally, I don't think he ever could have. I, so I totally agree with that. If you, if you don't that. have a player who can do that job, don't play that way. And that's why it's on the manager's shoulders always. Like It's always on the manager's shoulders. I don't believe for one second that Eric Ten Hag knows his players less than you and me. I just don't believe that. But we're only calling what we're seeing in match play. So we see it in match play and someone gets murdered on, on this. Always talk about off-ball, on-ball. You know, if Garnacho can't do the off-ball work and you can see the goal, you have to put him on the bench and find a solution. So I think Eric Ten Hag, I've always said this, is quite conservative and has his ideas and likes to push them. It might be in six games time, Scott, we're going, oh, look, do you know what? They've sorted that out. That's just, they've just, they've managed to sort that out tactically and it's got better. But do you know what? Like I said about Harry Maguire, Casemiro ain't getting quicker anytime soon. It's not getting quicker. So you really, you should have gone and got your Lavia, your Casado, or someone like that, your Declan Rice. You should have done that earlier. And instead, what's going to happen? It's all going to burn out. It's not going to work. And we're going to be saying, you know, Kobe Manu should be playing the six now. It's like, no, because he's going to... Go well, I think that's the plan. But that is the... that I think that's the plan. But I also think that it's it's more leaning towards failure to then be able to say to the board, oh, well, now we need to spend $100 million. You know, and the board go, oh, we don't even know we're going to sell the football club. Oh. So that's, again, a, a very Manchester United thing, isn't it? Is that... You look at Chelsea and I've said last week about them, like they're just buying everything and that's how they're going to do it. And that's their way. You still can do it in a, in a more kind of pragmatic way. But I don't like it that we're at the second game and we're talking about pre-season issues that we saw six to seven weeks ago. Um, Eric Ten Hag was talking about that as well, saying about, oh, we've not actually been together that long. What? We've been together six weeks. You know, you've been on a training pitch together for the, for six weeks. Work out the days, mate. So um, it's on the manager's shoulder. Like it's about Ole Gunnar Solskjaer when he played the double pivot every week with McFred. I say it's on him. It's on him. It's it's his choice. And if that it brings you success, great. But if it brings you failure, then normally... But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer played the double pivot to avoid the exact situation that we're seeing now. Yeah, and, and he played it because he didn't have any kind of tactical, like future-proofing like he just wanted to get through what he was getting through and and look 
great managers at Man United have had that as well. But uh, we had that with Mourinho. Is that while it worked and Man United came second, even though they were particularly bad still, then the next season when it didn't work, he lost his job. So I think for Ten Hag last year it worked great. We were happy. You win a trophy, third in the table. That's really good run. This year you've got to push on, haven't you? Somehow and. First two games of the season, we're certainly not seeing anything that looks like pushing on. I think what we are seeing is a more of a move to the style Eric Ten Hag wants to play rather than yes. last season, and it, it ain't clicking. But they do need four, to... 4-3-3, uh, isn't it? It's a, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of open 4-3-3, which is great at Ajax when no one does anything to you. But in the Premier League, even Wolves will hammer you, and then Wolves will go home and prove what they really are to Brighton. So you, you need to kind of be more like Brighton, Scott. I think that's kind of my catchphrase this year. It's just you need to have more options. And if you want to play beautiful football, you've got to do the work as well. And that is the, that's the truth. And I think United, these first two games for me, the work rate for me hasn't been consistent, especially in that second half at Tottenham. I thought yeah, that was where they show, really collapsed. Shows up in the stats, sprints. Uh, they, were, they were outdone by Tottenham. Yeah. Who are trying to impress a new manager, to be fair, who wants high energy football. Um, but I'll return to that question now. What will United do before the end of the window? Because I look right. I think Eric Ten Hag will persist with this midfield as his mm. first choice midfield, and that scares the crap out of me. I've got to be honest. Like I, 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 I was willing to give it a chance. I didn't understand the balance. You know that you. I think you and I agreed and have agreed for most of the year. Go get Declan Rice. Yeah. Rather than and play him alongside Casemiro because he mm. will offer you more, I want to say more energy, but more defensive nous. Uh, more of a he's more of a box to box shop than, than Mason Mount is, I suppose, which will give you a little bit more solidity. Um, but what will he do? Because obviously, United now have we've we spoke about Mason Greenwood. That is, I think, that is an option that they thought that they would have. And now they are going to have to panic because they're like, oh, we've still only got one striker. Exactly. Or maybe two. Um, exactly. If you include Martial. So that's an, that's an issue. They're obviously not scoring goals. They're not taking chances. Rasmus Hoyland isn't too far away. But the midfield as well. I I think they'll sign a midfielder before the, before the window closes. But I don't think that midfielder is going to be first choice. I think they're more focused at the moment on player outgoings. Like they are still negotiating on those things. They're still looking for buyers. They're looking to get players out the door because the one thing that hasn't changed, Scott, is that you need to get players off your wage bill and you, that, that's how you end up doing your business. You have to balance those books. I just again talked about Chelsea and I'll just mention them again. The reason why Chelsea have been able to do everything that they have done is that they've done that. They've got players off their books to be able to facilitate stuff, to be within FFP regulation. So that's kind of how they have done it. And they've done it in a fire sale way. You know, chuck a load of players out, buy a load of new players. Now, Man United are not doing that as it stands, but United do totally understand that they need to get players out the door so they can buy players because they're, they're still scouting. They're still doing what they normally do. But who do they buy? I think the, the need for a number six is obvious. So I, st I still think that they're in the market for a number six or someone who can play a defensive midfield role or maybe be a, a number eight that's good at doing the defensive function. Like, you know, we talk about Declan Rice. That's what I consider him as a number eight who can do the six and do it really well, but can also get up the pitch. But there's no Declan Rice on the market. So United are not going to go and buy someone for 100 million. But I do think the trend is going that way where you're probably going to have to pay more to get spe the specifics of what you want in terms of talent. I don't think we'll see that in this window. I think United will firefight. Is that they'll look at what they really need in the immediacy. A midfielder, I think, is that. And I do think that now Mason Greenwood is going out the door. This is what I was thinking the other day, and we've not spoken about this, Scott, is that the whole fact that you factored it into that you've got this striker coming back who scores How no goals. Incredible. Like and, inc and they've done that for a long time. And do you know what? This is why I said last week, and I'll say it again. This is why I don't blame Eric Ten Hag in terms of his opinion about Mason Greenwood, because he is here to win football matches. That's what he thinks about. He's not here to think about the reputation of Man United. He is here to run the football club to win games. That's what he thinks about. And he's been told for six months that this player's coming back. And I guarantee you, he's been banging on their door in the last few days and going, right, you've made this decision now. I want a striker. Go buy me another forward. Could United be in for someone like Kudus? Right. 
you know, suddenly now. Like, you have to go and get players that are gettable. Like, there is there, this is where you are, is that you, no magic happens in the next 10 days. You don't magic out a Neymar out or somewhere or something like that. You know, he's obviously gone to Saudi Arabia. We know why. But you can find players in that market that maybe are coming to the Premier League or are on Premier League standby where clubs like West Ham and, um, you know, we've seen Crystal Palace now actually exploring the market, looking for players, obviously looking for Wilf Saha uh, replacements, now bringing Lise on their contract. Chelsea obviously still buying everyone. Liverpool are looking at multiple targets. United are shopping in that marketplace still, Scott. And you've got to go find someone, haven't you? And you probably can go and get someone of a kudos standard, not world-class, but someone that knows the manager, someone that likes the manager. And it's a constant story, isn't it, with players, is that if they like Eric Ten Hag, then they have this kind of relationship with him. I wouldn't and- I wouldn't rule that out, by the way. I mean, I think West Ham are closing in on, on that yeah. deal. I think he's he wanted a release cause at Brighton, didn't get it. And that one kind of fell by the wayside. Yeah. But from, I, I reported United's interest in Kudus in as far back as January. Oh, like, it's been a year. It's, it's, it's been a long time. Yeah. And for me, I think the profile of that player might actually give United some benefit and play 10, Completely. either wing through the middle. Yeah. I think West Ham are close to a deal, but I think if he knows that there's potential of a move to a Champions League club, he will hold out and he will wait. Um, well, we'll wait and see. I'm sure West Ham want to get that one over the line as soon as possible. But I think that is, uh, you're looking at 40 million euros yeah. for, you know, a, a quality player. And I'll bring up as well, Ryan Gravenberg, who has uh, been linked with United yeah. since Eric Ten Hag arrived. They wanted him last year. He chose Bayern. It's not yeah. working out. He's pushing to get out of Bayern. United and Liverpool looking at him. Wants to yeah. come to the Premier League. If Bayern let him go, I think United would like a loan, but loan with option. But uh, we'll see. I mean, those are two players that would probably add to the add to the squad. Yeah. And they're two former uh, two IX players. <laughs> <laughs> we we are the IX B team. Um, but the the thing is, and and this is not being boastful or anything, but this is just again the layer that I end at Manchester United is that if you are Manchester United, you can go in to that level of the market and flex your muscle. So if you want a kudos, you can usurp a West Ham. You just can. You just go in there because you're in the Champions League now. So that's also something that was really important. We said going back six months ago when you're looking at your next lot of targets. But United are going to have to find ways to spin this Greenwood story now into a positive story. And that will be that he's leaving, but this guy is coming and we've done it now. And do you know what? We're United. We're flexing our muscle again. And do you know what? All these players, you know, they were going to go to these clubs, but we took them because we're United and that's the story here. I always remember years ago when Diego Forlan arrived in England to sign for another football club and Man United basically met him off the plane and went, no, we want you. And he came to United and that was it. That's that. Done. Middlesbrough, and, right? You know, I think it was Middlesbrough. Yes, of course. And that was a different time when Middlesbrough had a bit of cash. Um, but that this is the whole thing. that United like playing those games because they understand that in the marketplace, they are one of those super clubs. I think what you said about uh, Gravenberch as well there, I think that I think Liverpool are more keen on him and might be the ones that put the dollars up to get him. But, you know, if if Eric Ten Hag looks at his midfield and thinks secretly, actually, I need this player. I'm going to go and talk to Richard Arnold and say we really got to push for it. I would not be surprised to see, Scott, if you see that midfield and that forward come in. I think that's going to be where it is. If we can assume that Harry Maguire might leave but might not, I think that's a huge impact in terms of the defence. And you've got kind of a Tatibo on standby, but you're not going to go and find Jigvardio. Like, it doesn't exist. So you can't think like that at the moment. But I think United still do need goals. Like I think we, one thing we've said about Hoyland is that you know, he might not have an exceptional goal-scoring year this year because he's still learning and he's young and, you know, only got nine goals last year. So it'd be crazy to think he's going to get you the Greenwood goals, isn't it? Like, and you're in a different place now. Is Sancho going to get you the Greenwood goals? No, not at all. Where do you get those goals from? I think you have to go into the transfer market and you've got 10 days to fix that. Let us know your thoughts. Who United sign before the transfer window closes? I would, uh, as Rob touched on earlier, I would say that I think any incomings are really conditional on outgoings first happening. Yeah, uh, Donny van der Beek, Real Sociedad is potentially on. It's moving slowly, uh, but potentially Dean Henderson... Interest from Crystal Palace now. 
There's a They're going to be giving them away, Scott. That's what we said weeks ago. They, they take so long, they're just going to be giving people away now to get them off the books. That is how you do it, of course. Uh, fantastic. I think Scott McTominay is one that, that, that's marching. Again, you were talking about 40 million from the other day. Then last week, we were talking 30 million. I think we're down to 20. So I think Scott McTominay, if someone. Yeah, for me, you can't let him go. You can't let him you go, can't. Scott. But you saw it in that game against Tottenham where you needed energy. And the one play you decided not to go to was Scott McTominay. You went to everyone else, but you didn't go to Scott. And he sat on the bench. And did you see his face? Because he knows. He knows it's over. So he might. you might have to keep him because you've got no other choice. Like if you get an injury, you need Scott McTominay to play. And he'll, you know, he'll do his laces up and get out there for you. It doesn't mean you're going to get top four. Does it? So I think you're probably better off getting rid of him for whatever cut price you can get now, 20 to 30 million. Yeah, I'll take that tomorrow. And you don't need to reinvest that because someone, like if you go and get the lad from Bayern Munich, he's going to cost you around the same sort of money. You know, so it's not like he's going to cost you 40, 50, 60 million, or you might be able to get a loan out of that to get you going for just the time being. Um, but you need to move players out. And I like just said, Donny van der Beek, they want him gone. They want Dean Henderson gone. They want they want McTominay gone. They would love Maguire just to go. But they've got, they've got to make it work, Scott. It's on them, isn't it, to find the deals for these players to exit the football club. And if you take less money to help you move forward, that is what you do. That's as you said last week. That's what Arsenal did. And that is the right way to do your business. Yeah, let us know uh, what you think United will do. Let us know uh, your thoughts on anything we have talked about today. Um plenty of plenty of comments on the last show uh but yeah let us know drop us a line follow us on social media at double underscore scott saunders on x instagram and tiktok at underscore rob underscore b on twitter i'll call it twitter for you uh youtube as well uh rob's launched his channel and at Promise and MU on Twitter slash X as well. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and watch us on YouTube, the Promise and Manchester United podcast. Like, subscribe, leave a comment for us, as I just said, and pop that notification bell on so you never miss a show as well. Final thoughts, Rob? Um, it's going to be an interesting few days at Manchester United, isn't it? I think into the lead up of the end of the transfer window, but obviously the next game as well. Obviously, we'll talk about the next game in the next show on Friday a little bit more. Um, I'm not as confident, Scott, as maybe as I was a few weeks ago, <laughs> put it that way. It feels a little bit like, you remember Brentford, the Brentford show we did a year ago? And I remember we were both like, oh, God, like new manager, Eric 10 days and all of this. I'm not, I don't think it's as bad as that. I'm not there. No, of course not. And again, I have to keep reminding myself and saying it on socials <clears> as well that, you know, it's early, like early season blips are pretty normal. Do you remember... Uh, Antonio Conte, the year he won the league with Chelsea, first six games of the season, they were absolutely awful. And then it just they just got it right. They just they played a different system, 3-4-3, and they won a title. I, I don't think Ten Hag's going to change a lot, but I'm with you. I think he's going to stick with some of these things. And I think if they get it right on a training pitch, Scott, they might get it right in the Premier League, and that is important. So we will, it's a wait and see, isn't it? So uh, I've still got a little bit of faith, but maybe a little bit more anxious than I was when we were out in Las Vegas going, this could be a really good season this year. Um, there's other teams that look pretty good to me as well in these first two games. I think that's a worry for Man United is looking at the competitors and thinking they're getting better, are we? I think that's where we are in these next 10 days with the transfer window to go. Yes, as you say, 10 days. Is it 10 days? 10 days-ish left. Yeah. Friday, September 1st is transfer deadline day. Yeah. So uh, we'll be back. Before then, we'll be back on Friday to look ahead to the... It's not in Forest, right? No, it Old is. Trafford, I think. Yep. I'll you be there. Mm -hmm. I'll be there. Yep. Okay. If you're there, give Rob a wave. And uh, yeah, if you're there also. But yes, uh, thanks everyone for listening today. This has been the Promised Land podcast from Rob and Scott. We'll see you soon, everyone, for another episode. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. See you soon.